I'm going to continue on in the worship of our God in the preaching of His Word. But real quick, I have a um, quick announcement uh, because I do know that we have some guests with uh, children here. Uh, we do offer child care. And so um, if you uh, like, um, they're meeting in the multi-purpose room. And I think we have DJ. Where's DJ? DJ's right there in, in the back waving his hand. Uh, you can bring your... Uh, he's, our, he's our children's director, so you can bring your children to him, and then he'll uh, lead them to the rooms where there will be child care. All right? Um, and also, today is Father's Day. Uh, seems to be always overshadowed by Mother's Day, but it is Father's Day. And so if you haven't already, call your father and say, you know, happy Father's Day to him. And um, I just want to give you a, a word of encouragement for those of you who are fathers. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Uh, I do want to thank all of you men who have been faithful in raising up your children, uh, protecting them, providing for them, and just being a model of uh, faithfulness to them. And my exhortation to you um, and challenge or uh, encouragement would be to rise up, if you haven't already, to be someone who communicates to your children um, the glory of our Heavenly Father. Uh, you know, brothers, I want you, all of us, to... Um, to be men who rise up to the calling that God has given to us in the scriptures. And that is not simply to not restrain from bad things or uh, to think that you're good just because you have um, obeyed the law, but somebody who communicates to your children the glory of God. Will your children through your life know more of who God is, his love, his patience, his kindness, and his sacrifice. And a lot of this, it's not just a matter of you simply doing good things for your children, but being who God has called you to be. And um, we know that to become like God in order to communicate the attributes and the beauty and the glory of God to our children is to be conformed into the image of the Son of God. And so I hope uh, for all of our fathers here that you wouldn't just content yourself with being a decent man, uh, but that you would rise to the occasion that God has called you to be, to be a man who communicates the glory of God. And again, be in the word, be in prayer, so that through the word and in prayer you behold the glory of God through which you are conformed into the image of the Son. All right? It's my exhortation to you. Um, today's message, however, is not on fatherhood. Um, I guess it's, it's somewhat uh, related, but we're going to continue on in our study of uh, ethics. And um, in light of the subject of abortion that we have covered uh, for the past few weeks, I wanted to continue in the realm of uh, reproductive ethics and focus on the subject of in vitro fertilization. And uh, I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 56, Isaiah 56. Let's read together from verse 3 to verse 5. Isaiah 56, verse 3 to verse 5. Please rise as we honor the reading of God's word. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name. I shall not be cut off. Let's pray. God, we're reminded that even when we do not have the conveniences or the blessings of this world, we are some of the richest people who have ever lived. For we know the riches of salvation in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can have nothing, but Lord, we know that we have everything. Even in the loss of our life, we know that we experience the fullness of eternal life in Christ. 
And Lord, I pray for us as a church that we would treasure the relationship with, we have with you, that we would take a step back and ponder and meditate upon the eternal life that we have in Christ so that no matter what difficulty might come our way, we would be able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you always for your son and the salvation we have in him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And with our, with our church getting older, um, people getting married and starting families, uh, different challenges and issues begin to arise, including the struggle of infertility. Um, couples deal with infertility uh, in, in different ways, uh, where some couples are not too affected uh, emotionally. Uh, there are some couples, and I would say many couples, who are hit pretty hard by the news so that they struggle with all kinds of emotions, including frustration, uh, sadness, anger, and the inability to conceive, maybe even anger against God, who is the one uh, who providentially controls everything. Uh, maybe even shame, uh, feeling like there's something wrong with you or that you let your spouse down. The pain of infertility might be magnified when you hang out with uh, couples who do have kids. Um, so other sins of maybe envy or bitterness might begin to creep into your heart. And a day like Mother's Day or Father's Day like today are sharp reminders that you are not a father or you're not a mother. And what makes things worse may be the limited number of people who can understand. The singles at the church, they don't understand what you're going through. Couples with kids, Obviously, don't know what you're going to or understand what you're going through. Young couples who are not even trying to have kids will not understand what you're going through. And so the isolation might begin to drive you into a deeper place of despair. As a result, a number of people, including Christians, have considered to resolve this problem by turning to fertility treatments. But because many people make this decision in an emotional state, uh, they may not have really considered the ethics surrounding reproductive technology. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Um, and two points, I, I feel like it's appropriate for me to first address the subject of infertility, and then I want to get into uh, the ethics of in vitro fertilization. Okay? So two, uh, two topics or two points for today, infertility and in vitro fertilization. Subject of infertility, I want to, um, I know again, this is a sensitive subject, and so I want to give you two words of encouragement and counsel. And the first, it, it's pretty cliche, but it's a truth that we must that must that we must hold on to and cling to, and it's to simply entrust yourself to the Lord. Okay, entrust yourself to the Lord. The second um, is to become a spiritual mother. Okay, become a spiritual mother. And this can be um, obviously applied to our brothers here as well, but I want to speak mainly to our ladies uh, this evening. So entrust yourself to the Lord. Become a spiritual mother. Throughout Scripture, there have been a number of women who struggled with barrenness. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 1 through 2, it says, When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children or I shall die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Verse Samuel chapter 1, Hannah was a woman who could not conceive. And it says in verse 6 through 7, And her rival used to provoke her, that is Hannah, grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And then it says in verse 10, She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Deeply distressed. There's some of you... Ladies here are sisters who can experientially understand um, what I just read. You understand the pain, you understand the struggle and the frustration. Now, of course, there are a number of reasons why God chooses to close the womb. But there are only two ways in which you can respond. You can respond with faith, or you can respond with unbelief. You can respond with trust, or you can respond with doubt. And again, my exhortation to you is that you would entrust yourself to the Lord. Entrust yourself to the goodness and the sufficiency of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the incredible women that we see in Scripture is Ruth. What some of us might forget in light of the romance that, uh, between her and Boaz is that she was a woman who struggled with barrenness. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ruth, Ruth chapter 1. Ruth 
Ruth chapter 1. I'm going to read a good portion of this chapter, beginning with verse 4. And we'll read up to verse 18. Ruth chapter 1, verse 4. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilian died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So for ten years, Ruth was married, but um, both she and her sister-in-law did not conceive. They did not conceive. Practically, they were barren. Now listen to the heart of Ruth in the following verses. Verse 6. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. And she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, No more. Naomi, in her bitterness of having lost her husband and her two sons, cried out, and she said that the Lord has gone out against me, and effectively against Orpah and Ruth. And so she told them to return back to their lands, told the daughters, uh, her daughters-in-law, go back to your land, go back to your parents, go back to your families, even go back to your gods. But Ruth, she refused. It was the Lord that had effectively closed her womb and pressed the heavy hand of judgment against her family, even her own husband. But instead of abandoning Yahweh, the God of Israel, instead of being bitter against him, instead of being angry against him, turning her back against him and turning to Chemosh, the God of Moab, the God of her parents and her family, she cried out and she said, what? Your people shall be my people and your God My God, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord Yahweh do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. She still submits herself to the God of Israel. She still submits herself to Yahweh. She clung to Naomi, but more so, she clung to the Lord. She clung to Naomi's God, trusting him, even when it seemed like that he had taken everything away from her. Her actions echo the words of Job, who said in Job chapter 1, verse 21, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And here we come to the source of our comfort, our strength, and our hope. And that is God. It's God. The ultimate joy and the meaning that we have as Christians is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The ultimate joy and the meaning and the purpose that we have as Christians is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So often it's so easy to see our worldly environment, to see our circumstances as the source of our grief and our joy, whether it might be our academics, our career, our finances, our romantic relationships, our family, and even our children. So so that when circumstances are hard, we fall into despair. When things are good, we live in contentment and happiness. But the ultimate joy that we have as believers 
is knowing that the Son of God has come down into this world and perished and sacrificed himself upon the cross so that we might have a living relationship with God the Father. Knowing that our sins have been cleansed because the Son of God has been damned for our sins. Knowing that we have a newness of life because we resurrected in union with the Son of God. This is our ultimate joy. This is our meaning in life. So the hardships that we experience in this world can never strip away the joy and the purpose that we have. And the blessings that we have on this earth can never surpass, it can never surpass the blessings that is in Jesus Christ. So when you're found in a place of darkness, even when you are deprived of the gift to children, your contentment and ultimate joy is in knowing that you have the Lord. And nothing in this world can take that away. Nothing in this world can take that away. In Isaiah chapter 56, as we read, it says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant. I will give them my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. I'll give you something better than children. I'll give you a gift that is in me, an eternal life, a name that is everlasting, where you'll be with your Savior and your Creator for all of time. The call and the encouragement to trust God is something that we throw out so often that it can lose its weight of significance. So take the time to think about that truth. Meditate upon it. And let that massive, infinite weight of glory make an impression upon your heart so that you can say that God is enough. Christ is enough. So trust yourself to the Lord. Trust yourself to the Lord. second word of encouragement and counsel I would give to you ladies is to become a mother to the younger ladies here in the church. Sometimes we can become so focused on what we don't have that we lose sight of the things that we do have. In this case, we have a family here at Cross Life. This This is family. In Mark chapter 10, verse 29 to 31, It says, Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions in the age to come eternal life. How many who are first will be last, the last first. For those of us who have given up much in order to follow Christ, there is much that we gain. And one of the blessings that we gain in this world is the family that we have in Christ. In Christ, we have this spiritual community. It is called the church. And the Lord describes the nature of this community by using an intimate and a sacred relational term. Of all the words that he can use, just a society, a club, what does he use? What's the term that he uses to describe this community? It's family. That's what he uses, Family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, fathers, mothers, children in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, says, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And Paul wasn't married. He had no wife. He had no kids. He chose a life of celibacy in order to meet the sacrificial demands of pastoral and evangelistic ministry. But this did not mean that he was alone, for he chose to lead men and women to the gospel and to raise them up in the instruction of God's word, as a father would. In Acts chapter 20, Paul was about to make his way to Jerusalem where he, was, um, where he knew he would be in prison. But before his departure, he was uh, uh, met by the elders of Ephesus. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Let's read from verse 36 to 38. Acts chapter 20, verse 36 to 38, he says, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. 
and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. They accompanied him to the ship. I thought this was a beautiful uh, scene. The elders of Ephesus, they journeyed to see Paul before he would make his way to Jerusalem. And knowing that they would not see him again, they wept and they cried. Because they were losing somebody who was dear to them. In the church community, even in here, you can make real relationships as shallow as you want. (laughs) You really can. You can come here and just cut out. Obviously, that's not a good thing. But you can make it deeper than even some of your most intimate familial relationships here. Because the bonds that we have in Christ is more than just the blood that runs through our veins. But the Holy Spirit of God who fills our soul and then unites us together into the body of the Son of God. So that we live a life together. We can live a life together in the most meaningful way. Because we are united together in Christ, we are focused on a common goal, the goal of the kingdom of heaven. We share in the same purpose, the same purpose for life, that is the glory of the king of kings. We're rejoicing in the same blessing, the blessing that we have in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So together we remind each other of these truths. We help, each other, we help each other as we move forward towards this goal, this purpose. We suffer together. We bear each other's burdens. We carry and lift each other up when we fall down. We rejoice together. We weep together. We call each other out. We, something, we see something wrong, we tell them what is wrong because we don't want them to stumble. We don't want them to fall into sin. We're willing to have that uncomfortable discussion and talk with one another in order to help each other. We do ministry together. We tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ together. We get rejected together. In Christ, you can share some of the deepest and most meaningful interactions and develop a relationship that is forged through hardship, discomfort, mortification of the ego, disagreement, conflict, and sacrifice as you and your sister or you and your daughter in Christ pursue the things of God. You can have that. Or just a shallow relationship. We come in and out. Titus chapter 2, verse 3 to 5, it says, All the women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. So train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. All the women teach what is good. Be a spiritual mother. Be a big sister to each other. And um, it requires for you to be intentional. It requires you to think outside of yourself and what makes you comfortable, what makes it easy for you. But the risk, the possibility of you being dismissed, your offer to meet up, to be rejected, requires for you to be humble. And to think about lifting others up, even if it comes at the expense of your comfort and your ego. And um, I hope you would pursue that, ladies. I hope you would. I pray that you would. All I can do as your pastor is to point you in the direction, try to give you a nudge. But you got to walk that path. Okay? Now, When the heart is right before God, when you have this heart where you're entrusting yourself to God and you're even taking opportunities around you to love and disciple and care for the younger ladies in the church or even your peers, then I would say you're in a place, your heart is in the right place as you move forward with um, seeking uh, even fertility treatments because you're in a place where you know that God grants you a child or he doesn't give you a child it's okay because you have God okay he gives you a child you know that that child must be dedicated unto the Lord raised up in the instruction of God and if he chooses not to give you a child then you know it's fine because you have the Lord so your heart is in the right place It's in the place where it should be. 
So I want to get into the second point for today's message, which is in vitro fertilization, the ethics of in vitro fertilization. Generally, when we struggle, there can be a temptation to quickly resolve the problem so that we become impatient, resulting in rash decisions, sometimes even in sinful decisions. And this is also true for the struggle of infertility. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 through 2, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1 through 3 says, When Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she envied her sister. She said to Jacob, Give me children or I shall die. Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Then she said, Here is my servant uh, Bilhah. Go into her, so that she may give birth on my behalf, that even I may have children through her. As desperation had overtaken even the matriarchs of Scripture. They felt like they had... They had to have children at all costs so that they were willing to even resort to sin. The same emotions can overtake women so that they think that they uh, must have their own biological children. And so they may resort to fertility treatments without really thinking about the ethical implications of their actions. People obviously consider the finances necessary to undergo the procedures, but they're completely mindless about the ethical and the theological principles that should guide their decisions. So I really want to help you think through the issues of fertility treatment, specifically in vitro fertilization. And um, look, I know um, there's some of you who have not been mindful, you haven't been thoughtful or prayerful um, in undergoing fertility treatments. And, and I was thinking about this, and, and part of that is on me. Um, Sometimes I think I should have preached on this topic earlier. I feel like it was in a blink of an eye um, that you went from being in college to where you are now, where you're married and uh, you're having children. But and it's for this reason why I'm preaching it now. But if you've already gotten fertility treatments without much thought and prayer so that you made unwise or even sinful decisions, I bring that before the Lord. Confess any acts of folly or even acts of sin and confess any heart or feelings of idolatry or unbelief that may have driven you to make a rash decision. And let's rest in the grace of God together. Okay. For everyone else, moving forward, I pray that you would be fervent in pursuing wisdom and making hard ethical decisions, and that you would be mindful as you... Uh, move forward in uh, fertility treatments if that is something that you're looking into. And together as a church, let's be faithful making sure that those who join the church later on are informed of these ethical decisions, okay? Or ethical issues. So let's begin with explaining what in, what in vitro is. In vitro literally, literally means in glass and refers to a technique of fertilizing a woman's egg outside of her womb in an artificial environment and then having the embryo implanted into the mother's womb. The procedure involves a number of steps. First, the wife's eggs uh, and the husband's sperm is harvested. Second, the eggs are then fertilized to make an embryo in a petri dish. These embryos are then tr either transferred into the mother's womb or frozen to be possibly used later. The hope would be that the embryo would implant itself to the uterine lining so that the child might grow and be born. But the first cycle fails and a frozen embryo is thawed and another attempt is made. Now, the main ethical, ethical factor that we have to consider in this process is that the fertilized egg is a child, okay, as we talked about last week. That is the main thing that you must consider, not just simply acknowledge with your mind, but something that must be impressed upon your heart. Some, if not many, people can get consumed and obsessed with the idea of getting pregnant that they don't stop and realize that each and every one of the fertilized eggs outside their womb is their baby, is their child, a precious and sacred person made in the image of God. Because an embryo doesn't have a form of a developed child, it's easy not to count that baby as a baby, not to only count it as a child, and to only count it as a child if the implantation is successful. But the fact is, every fertilized egg is your baby boy, is your baby girl. That child is a gift from God, a child precious. 
but a child in a very precarious place of survival. It's with that reality of a baby's personhood in the forefront of our minds and our hearts that you move forward to make a decision, that you should make the decision to create life in vitro. If you choose to make that weighty decision, then it is to move forward with, this, move forward with successive decisions that best ensures the survival and the health of your baby. So again, the main ethical factor is the personhood of the unborn child. That's the first thing you must have in your mind and in your heart. The second thing that you must consider is the rate of success when using in vitro, because it's a matter of whether or not your child will survive. The CDC says the following. It says, based on CDC's 2020 fertility clinic success rate uh, report, there were three, 300, uh, 326,468 ART, that is assisted reproductive technology cycles, performed at 449 reporting clinics in the United States during 2020, resulting in 75,023 live births, deliveries of one or more living infants, and 79,942 live-born infants. Of the 326,468 ART cycles performed in 2020, 123,304 uh, 123, were, uh, were egg or embryo banking cycles in which all resulting eggs or embryos were frozen for future use. Although the use of ART is still relatively rare as compared to the potential demand, its use has more than doubled over the past decade. Approximately 2% of all infants born in the United States every year are conceived using ART. Now, so let's kind of break down the numbers here real quick. Uh, there were 326,468 ART cycles, which include 123,304 embryo banking cycles. So if you Subtract 123,304 from 326,468, you get 203,164, okay? Now it says here that there were 75,023 live births from the 203,164. That is a success rate of 37%, okay? And 79,942 live-born infants from the 200. Uh, 203,000, approximately, ART cycles, giving a success rate of about 39%. Okay? So 37%, 39%, respectively. Now, these numbers might seem pretty good, but we have to remember that each ART cycle doesn't always include the transfer of a single embryo. And 123,304 uh, 304 embryo banking cycle doesn't mean that a single embryo was frozen. So the rate of success for a live birth per embryo transfer to the mother's womb is lower than 37%, and the rate of live births per embryo made is even lower. So again, considering the rate of success, survival. Third factor you need to consider is the rate of a frozen embryo. The, the, you consider the survival rate of a frozen embryo through the thawing process. This is also another thing that must be considered. According to John Hopkins, a Johns Hopkins article, the survival rate is about 95%. The NIH has an article entitled Comparing Thaw Survival, Implantation, and Live Birth Rates from Cryopreserved Zygotes, Embryos, and Blastocysts. This paper is much more technical, it's more precise. And the authors uh, of this paper, they say the following. They conclude with these words. A total of uh, 1,991 zygotes, 2,880 D3 embryos, and 503 blastocysts were cryopreserved and thawed during this time period. The survival rate was 69% for thawed zygotes, 85% for D3 embryos, and 88% for blastocysts. Okay. Now, zygotes, D3 embryos, and blastocysts are different stages of embryonic development. So they're just trying to see which, at what point of embryonic development does the child have the best chance of survival. Now, with this sample size used in the study, their rates of survival were uh, much less than what uh, John Hopkins' article said of, uh, of 95%. Um, fourth factor to consider is the number of embryos to transfer. The American Society of Reproductive Medicine and the Society for Assisted Reproductive Medicine Technology, which bas basically recommends that one, the transfer of one embryo at a time. So this was actually news to me. Before in the past, it was multiple embryos that was recommended. And this is what it says, the patients with favorable prognosis. It says, in, in the, patients, the patients of any age, the transfer of a euploid embryo, uh, an embryo with the correct number of chromosomes, has the most favorable prognosis and should be limited to one. 
Patients under the age of 35 should be encouraged to receive a single embryo transfer regardless of the embryo stage. For patients between 35 and 37 years of age, strong consideration should be made for a single embryo transfer. For patients between 38 and 40 years of age, no more than three cleavage stage embryos or two blastocysts should be transferred. In cases where the euploid embryos are available, single blastocyst embryo transfer should be the norm. Patients 41 to 42 years of age should plan to receive no more than four cleavage stage embryos or bl three blastocysts. In cases where euploid embryos are available, a single blastocyst transfer should be the norm. Okay? So for the, on the younger side, recommend a single embryo transfer. Those who are get older, it kind of sets a limit in terms of the number of embryos that should be transferred. Now, in the NIH article entitled The Effects on Pregnancy and Multiples of Transferring 1 to 3 Embryos in Women at Least 40 Years Old, it says the following. Results suggested that the average pregnancy rate when, uh, um, when up to 3 embryos were transferred was 25% for women 40 years old, 20% uh, for women 41 years old, 16% for women 42 years old, and 17% for women 43 years old, 8% for women 44 years old, 6% for women 45 years old, and 0% for women 46 years old. No live births occurred in women treated after their 44th birthday, and only patients younger than 42 years of age received double embryo transfer had a live birth of twins. Live birth rates increased as more embryos were transferred for 40 and 42-year-old subjects. Now, the reason why I bring this up, the reason why it's important is because the thing that you need to consider is the success rate, not of a pregnancy, but the success rate of the survival of each embryo. Although for younger women, a single embryo transfer is recommended for each cycle, older women have a greater chance at pregnancy, according to this data, with multiple embryo transfer. But the critical question to ask, the ethical question to ask is, will the multiple embryo transfer decrease the survivability of each individual embryo. Did you hear that? Okay. Well, the multiple embryo transfer, though it might increase the possibility and the rate of pregnancy, will it decrease the survivability of each individual embryo? Because you want to give each of your children the greatest opportunity to live. Now, I have some data on this from before, but as I looked at the uh, date, it seems to be um, outdated. I tried to find some more recent uh, statistical numbers, but I couldn't find one. So this is a question you must answer by talking to your physician and your fertility specialist, okay? That's something you must answer before moving forward with something like this, if you plan to do more than a single embryo transfer. Now, considering these principles, the principles and things and the principles I've given, should a couple pursue IVF as a Christian? Well, Christians debate about this. The ethicist and uh, theologian John Feinberg, who is very thorough and thoughtful, um, he, believes IVF should be, uh, he believes IVF to be morally unacceptable given the low rate of success. He says the following, our view our views on the embryo status lead, lead to our greatest moral objection to IVF. <laughs> namely its waste and loss of embryonic life. Fertilizing multiple eggs with the knowledge and even intent that some won't implant in the womb and that others, once implanted, will be expelled by the body is morally wrong. Loss of these embryos is loss of human life. If the success rate of IVF had risen to 95% or even 80 to 85%, we would be more sympathetic to it. But as the statistics cited show, IVF technology is currently nowhere near such success rates we find the loss of so much human life morally unacceptable. And this is a really something to consider. Knowing the rate of survival, will you willingly choose to create a life that may die? Now, the theologian Wayne Grudem, he has a different opinion. He came out with a relatively recent article on uh, the Gospel Coalition, entitled, How IVF Can Be Morally Right. And he says the following, IVF is used by a married couple, and if care is taken to prevent the intentional destruction of embryos, then it is a morally good action that pleases God because it violates no scriptural guidelines, achieves the moral good of overcoming infertility, and brings the blessing of children to yet another family. 
And I quote these two men to show that this is not a simple decision. What Feinberg says about the large loss of life, the large loss of life is true. Okay? But what Grudem says is also true, that overcoming infertility to have children is a blessing from God. The question is, does the overcoming of infertility and the joy of children, does it overrule the low rate of success of IVF? Does the blessing of children justify a process that results in a large loss of life? Now, this is not an easy question to answer. I wrestled with this. Um, and even as you guys are hearing this, some of you are coming to different conclusions. But to answer that question, there's a more fundamental question that needs to be answered. Generally, okay, generally, is it morally wrong to have children knowing that the survivability of an unborn child might be low? So generally speaking, not specifically to in vitro, generally speaking, is it morally wrong to have children knowing that the survivability of an unborn child might be low? And I think answering this question brings a lot of clarity. Consider a couple that have been trying to have a child naturally, but they consistently have miscarriages, suggesting that specifically for them, so just for them, there's a low rate of survivability for every child that is conceived. Would it be morally wrong for them to continue to try to have a child? Would it be morally wrong? They're able to conceive regularly, but they have miscarriages regularly. Would it be morally wrong for them to continue to try to have kids? I would personally be hard-pressed to say that it's morally wrong. But at the same time, it's not a non-issue either. Miscarriages, some of you know, is very difficult. Let's push, so let's push this hypothetical. What if you were able to conceive, but the child passed away consistently within the third trimester, where the humanity of the baby is much more visually obvious? I imagine that would take a very heavy toll on your hearts to consistently have miscarriages of a child who is more or less formed, so that you might seriously consider whether or not you want to keep trying. I believe this is the kind of attitude and heart in which we must proceed with IVF. It's so easy to move forward with the procedure without humanizing the embryos that were made outside of the womb so that our hearts might be unaffected by the loss of life. Like, oh, it didn't work. Let's just try again. Let's just move on with the next one. But that attitude doesn't honor your child who is sacred and precious and does not honor the God whose image that child bears. A child must be treated as a child, and that's just simply acknowledged with our minds. In some, I believe it is morally permissible, but not without the possibility of a great cost for individual couples, a cost for which we must mourn, so that this decision that every couple makes must be made before God. This is your decision before the Lord, I believe. But without a doubt, if you commit to move forward with the procedure of IVF, you must engage in the procedure with a heart that humanizes the child as you would if that child were naturally conceived within your womb so that you move with care, prayer, and wisdom. Now, with that being said, there are several applications that should be more or less obvious in moving forward with IVF. It should be obvious, but I'll say it nonetheless, okay? Just in case it's not. You should not discard any embryos, including those with genetic defects, because that is your child. If your child was born with defects, child of five-year-old still had the defects, would you abandon them? Of course not. It's your baby boy, it's your baby girl. Second, you must avoid selective reduction. Selective reduction is practically abortion. Some women find themselves pregnant with multiple children through IVF, so they abort one of their children because of the preference to have one child or for the reduction of medical complications that do not threaten the mother's life. These are not reasons to abort a child just because you want to fulfill some kind of preference. Okay? So you must avoid selective reduction. Third, do not create more babies through IVF than you would like to have. Be willing to transfer every embryonic child into the womb to give him or her the best chance for life. Often women who undergo IVF, their goal is to simply get pregnant with a healthy kid. 
As a result, women typically try to retrieve and fertilize as many eggs as possible in one IVF session because it's more cost-effective. They fertilize them and discard the unhealthy child because they want a healthy baby. And if they find themselves to be pregnant, they discard the rest of the embryos. It just becomes medical waste. But the goal of the Christian is not to simply get pregnant, but to do everything that we can to make sure that the child has the best chance for life. And this is not just a matter of practically providing an opportunity for life, but genuinely wanting, desiring, and hoping for every child to live. There are couples that I know who went through IVF, and um, they had a number of embryos prepared. I think it was about six, maybe even eight. And by the grace of God, the first few cycles um, were successful so that they were able to give birth to a few children. Now, the couples, the Christian couple, couldn't discard the rest of the embryos. Their conviction before the Lord compelled them to follow through with transferring the rest of the rest of their children into the womb um, to give them the best chance for life, which was not an easy thing to do considering that the ladies were getting older. Now, of course, I'm grateful that these couples chose to give every child the best chance for life, but remember, the mindset and the heart of the Christian shouldn't be just reluctant obligation for a child to live. Right? What, a, what, a, what a sad thing for your parents, a reluctant obligation, right? but a joy to have children. So do not fertilize more eggs than the number of children you're willing to raise. Now, some might consider the option of embryonic adoption so that if they find themselves with extra embryos, they just give them up for adoption. That's something I don't know if you guys know. So if a couple has more extra embryos, they will give them up to an embryonic adoption center. Now, this seems like a reasonable solution. Seems like a good thing to do. You're saving the life. You're preserving life. But this may not be an option for you when you really think about it. Uh, there's an incident that happened uh, where a mixed-race couple that I know went through IVF, and they had um, leftover embryos that they gave up for uh, adoption to a Christian embryonic adoption center. And this is what they did. But what ended up happening was that there was another couple from that same church who chose to adopt a child from that Christian embryonic adoption center. But that second couple was also of the same mixed race, so that the probability of them adopting the biological child of that first couple was relatively high. You understand what's happening, the scenario, situation? Like, yes? I'll say it again, okay? I'll explain it real quick. Okay. So there was a couple, a mixed-race couple. They had extra embryos. They were doing IVF. They had extra embryos. They gave them up for adoption at a Christian embryonic adoption center. There was another couple in the same church who chose to adopt from that same embryonic adoption center. But that couple, that second couple, was also of the same mixed race. And, you know, adoptions, uh, and what they wanted was a child who would look like the the adopted parents. So the probability of them adopting the biological child of the first couple was relatively high. So you understand the situation? You guys need to practice responding. Okay, so, uh, okay, good. Okay. And so that first couple started getting worried because they might grow up, they felt like they, they might grow up in the same church as their child, the, their biological child that they gave up for adoption, a possibility that would be especially obvious if the child shared the unique physical features of his or her biological parents. The couple got worried. But why? Why did they get worried? They didn't feel like they did anything wrong when they gave up the embryos for adoption. In fact, it seemed like a good thing to do, right? upholding the sanctity of life. So why were they at unease? And I, and I thought about the situation. It was interesting. And I believe it's because practically, in practice, they may have minimized their child's humanity, even though they intellectually acknowledge their child's humanity. So the idea that they would see their biological child grow up in front of them to another couple in the church made them feel uneasy because the presence of their child would be a practical, real reminder and confrontation of a decision where they did not fully consider the value and the weight of their child's humanity. I think a good way to evaluate whether the choice to give an embryo up for adoption is a result of a genuine act of necessity for your family or love for your children or a practical decision of convenience that proceed from a heart that has minimized an embryo's humanity is whether you would give up that same child if he was one or two months old. Would you give up, if you gave birth to that child, one or two months old, biologically your kid, would you give them up for adoption? Would you make the same decision? I don't think many of us would feel compelled to give up our kid. 
unless the circumstances were dire. So that's how you can tell. As Christians, we can, with our lips, acknowledge the humanity of other people and children. But we got to really take a step back, examine our hearts, and think, is that what we feel? Now, don't get me wrong, embryonic adoption is a beautiful thing. I'm just saying that with decisions we make, we must fully consider and treasure the humanity of our baby. It's your baby. Now, I briefly talked with Pastor Matt yesterday and by God's providence because he sent me an article called Christian Guide to IVF, written by a couple, Joseph and Monica Walter. The article talked about a practice that I was not aware of, um, but definitely something to look into if uh, IVF is something that you are thinking about. It's a practice of egg freezing. And this is what they say. Further with egg freezing, since the eggs are frozen and thawed prior to fertilization, this approach also eliminates the thaw survival risk for embryos. In a typical IVF process, there is a risk that when one of the baby's embryo is thawed, they do not survive the process. While the frozen egg, now I, don't, I don't know how to pronounce this, oocyte, okay, oocyte, uh, may not be viable after being thawed, this does not present a risk to a child's life because it is prior to conception. Overall, that makes this method safer for babies conceived in the process by avoiding the thaw survival risk. As for the effectiveness of this method of IVF studies, I've shown that oocytes vitrification is just as likely to produce healthy pregnancies as fresh embryo transfers like those used in the initial cycle of typical IVF. The only challenge with IVF using egg freezing is that it is less widely available. However, because it is simpler for the couple to navigate, lim uh, navigate, eliminates the possibility of having frozen embryos at the end of the process, and is safer for the babies that are conceived, I would encourage the couple considering IVF to find a clinic that offers the option to do IVF with egg freezing, even if some travel is required. Okay? So this is a very, very good option. And the reality of life and family um, the reality of life and family are gifts from God. In life, we experience a taste of the vitality that is sourced in the Creator. And in family, we experience a taste of the beauty of relationships that exist within the Godhead. It's for this reason why we naturally, because we've been made in the image of God, why we naturally treasure life and we hold sacred the bonds of family and the blessings of children. And God has designed salvation to be a heightened and even transcendent and perfected quality and experience of these blessings as the Lord offers us eternal life in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he adopts us into his family so that God is our Father and Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is our brother. And so we endeavor, as we endeavor to grow a family with children, it must be with the full understanding of the sanctity of life and the preciousness of familial relationships, especially in light of reproductive technology that influences so many to reduce the miracle of conception to a cold and functional and financial and pragmatic process, as science and lab work can sometimes be. And if God chooses to keep us from having biological children, He ordains us to be single. The joy and contentment that we have as believers is that we know life in ways that no other being in creation knows it, a life that is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that we have a family more sacred and precious than the most cherished relationship on earth, a family that is the church in the Son of God, where God is our Father and Christ our brother. The gospel deepens our understanding of the blessings we have on earth, shaping our decisions regarding those blessings simultaneously submitting them to the greatest gift of which the earthly blessings is just a taste, the gift of eternal life and a relationship with the living God in Christ. Let's pray. Father, um, I know that today is just um, another one of the messages where there's a lot of technical information. My God, uh, we are amazed always how despite the complexity of the situations that are laid before us you provide for us beautiful truths and principles to navigate through all the tricky issues even as society advances with technologies that blur the line between right and wrong between good and evil God you give us truths to, to work through 
And Lord, I pray that uh, you continue to grant me much wisdom and you will continue to grant the church much wisdom as we um, make personal decisions in our lives that are not so black and white, so that, that are not clear cut. And Lord, I pray that at the end of the day, always our motivation will not be for the sake of the self, ultimately for the pleasure of the self and the convenience of the self apart from you, but ultimately for the glory of God. Thank you, O Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.